This is Beyond Species, a podcast exploring issues around speciesism and the struggle to dismantle it. I'm Tofu Steve and welcome to the episode. In this episode, we hear from Solarpunk Anarchist. He provides an introduction to Solarpunk, a science fiction genre that sprang up around 2010, which imagines a hopeful future for all. He expands on the links between Solarpunk and anarchism, in particular, social ecology, which seems to mirror the ideals of Solarpunk. Solarpunk Anarchist explains some of the practical steps that might be taken to create a Solarpunk world and how this niche genre might inform our social justice movements. So if you want to start then by telling us, what is solar punk? Solar punk is an aesthetic slash cultural movement. Uh, I say movement. At this stage, it's uh, quite niche. It's really more of a subculture oriented around envisioning the kind of future we'd actually like to live in as opposed to the usual visions of the future that seem to be rife in fiction which uh, tend to paint things in a more dystopian or post-apocalyptic light at least those that have been more popular in this century thus far it's oriented around trying to blend technology with ecology those two principles and trying to find a way to synthesize them, trying to think of what kind of problems we face in the existing world and how we could use technology and new forms of social organization to think our way around them. And its particular vision of the future involves reshaping the world according to green technology and the decentralization of power. There are other forms of ecology, like uh, one, for example, is called eco-modernism, which, uh, again, involves blending technology with ecology, but that involves doing it in a more sort of state-centric and corporate-centric manner, whereas solar punk is all about decentralizing uh, Mm -hmm. the distribution of power rather than concentrating it. So I think that's like the Cliff Notes version of what solar punk is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And could you give us some examples of solar punk literature or the aesthetics of it? In terms of the aesthetics of it, it uh, borrows a lot from uh, a art style that was popular in the late 19th century called Art Nouveau, which was all about organic floral patterns, uh, bright colors, integrating the styles of many different cultures into one style, like taking inspiration from East Asian and African aesthetics taking inspiration from the kind of machine processes that uh, allowed new types of design to take shape and uh, Mm. it didn't last very long it only lasted about 10 years but uh, you can see a lot of similarity there and a lot of inspiration being drawn from there if you also look at for example the films of the Japanese anime director Hayao Miyazaki that's very solar punk in a lot of ways, especially one of his first films, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. It's a kind of mm-hmm. low-tech version of solar punk, both in aesthetic and in principles, which is the idea that we should relate to the natural world in a relationship of non-domination, mutual cooperation, rather than humanity trying to dominate uh, nature, as is mm-hmm. the traditional way that uh, most civilizations tend to frame the relationship between humans and the natural world. Uh, In Mm -hmm. terms of solar punk literature, as I said, thus far, it's very niche. Unlike, say, its uh, earlier punk offshoots in literature, in science fiction and fantasy, there's never been a big breakout novel that's caused the subgenre to explode in popularity, as there has been in cyberpunk or steampunk. But Mostly, thus far, it's confined to short fiction, but uh, hopefully if uh, we're coming into a new decade now and uh, it'll be the second decade of solar punk's existence, I'm hoping that we will see more examples of the genre and maybe there will be 
a very popular example of the genre that explicitly calls itself uh, solar punk, which will mm -hmm. cause it to gain more of an audience. Thus far, we've had a number of short fiction collections like Wings of Renewal, a solar punk dragon anthology, Biketopia, feminist bicycle science fiction stories in extreme futures, which uh, it's not entirely solar punk, but it has examples of solar punk in it. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, uh, Sun Vault, sto stories of solar punk and eco speculation. And uh, I think most recently, Glass and Garden, solar punk summers. So as I said, mostly short fiction thus far. There was also for a time a uh, online uh source of solar punk fiction called solar punk press which it's still up i think although it's been dormant for a while i think the creators uh decided to shut it down and focus on other things although you can still see uh i think some examples of the fiction that was up there both in written form and they also have audiobook forms of each story okay. as i as i recall mm -hmm. with some interesting artwork as well accompanying each story mm -hmm. okay so is solar punk then a reaction to cyberpunk? Because it seems to be like the complete opposite of cyberpunk, which is obviously about dystopias and like corporate and government control. But solar punk is like about a more hopeful future. So like, how does it stand in contrast to cyberpunk? Yeah, it you could look at it almost like a dialectical negation of uh, cyberpunk in that Cyberpunk warned against the kind of future we don't want to live in, whereas Solarpunk, by contrast, points towards the kind of future we should be trying to live in. It's almost like a positive-negative thing, mm -hmm. if you will, that uh, I think in principle, at least Cyberpunk in its early, more anti-authoritarian form, they were kind of animated by the same set of general values in that we shouldn't want to live in a world defined by pollution, centralization of power, and hierarchy. Mm -hmm. That is core, I think, to both the original form of cyberpunk as well as solarpunk, but they mm -hmm. go about animating those values and illustrating those values in opposite ways. One does it by illustrating the kind of future we should avoid, and the other does it by illustrating the kind of future we should want to create. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where does social anarchism fit in then into the, the picture of solar punk? Because that's the angle that you're coming from, as you've seen that social anarchism and solar punk are kind of complementary and can work together. So do you want to explain some more about that? Indeed. Uh, I run a uh, Facebook page and accompanying blog called Solar Punk Anarchist, which uh, I noticed when I first discovered solar punk just from an article in the New Republic uh, talking about new forms of utopian fiction, that it was, I was like, wow, this seems to have unintentionally, but still at the same time, very noticeably ended up reinventing many of the same ideas that uh, I was already familiar with from the political and philosophical tradition of social anarchism, in particular a subset of that called post-scarcity anarchism, which uh, emerged and briefly shone brightly before flickering out in the 1960s and 70s. It was coined by a man called Murray Bookchin. Most of his best work, in my opinion, was done in the 1960s and 70s, and he coined this new form of philosophical thinking he called social ecology, which uh, the central tenant of that philosophy was the premise that all of our existing human social problems are rooted in hierarchy and domination, and that all of the ecological problems that exist are in turn as a result of social problems. So you have this chain where it's like, Problems with the natural world, like pollution, uh, deforestation, desertification, uh, industrial farming, uh, all of these problems are rooted in human social problems, and the human social problems are in turn rooted in organizing ourselves in a hierarchical fashion. Mm -hmm. To put it another way, we treat nature in this authoritarian manner because we treat each other in an authoritarian manner, and... Bookchin's notion was that if we start treating each other in a more 
cooperative and egalitarian fashion that will naturally be reflected in the way we treat nature and solar punk again more than 50 years apart and without i think any taking any direct inspiration from bookchin and that tradition ended up coming arriving at more or less the exact same set of ideas and uh Initially, many of the people who were involved with it, with solar punk as an online subculture on websites like uh, Tumblr, DeviantArt, Pinterest, uh, just sharing bits and bobs they found all over the internet, which they said, this evokes a very solar punk vibe. I think this is solar punk. I think mm-hmm. you join these two things together, they're solar punk. They touched on many of the same ideas as social ecology and social anarchism without being conscious of it. But as more people started being made aware, hey guys, you're actually, uh, you've managed to touch on many of the same ideas as this other thing. More people from both started acknowledging that similarity and more people who were solar punks started being drawn to social anarchism and more people who were social anarchists started being drawn to solar punks. So mm-hmm. as it stands now, it's a kind of, it's a very close relationship. I, I wouldn't say that solar punk by itself is innately anarchist. Uh, mm. I do think at the very least it's anti-authoritarian. I wouldn't expect everyone who's into solar punk to naturally become an anarchist, but I do think mm-hmm. more than a few do once they realize that, oh, anarchism isn't all about causing chaos. It's not uh, about disorder and violence and all these other things. It's about Mm -hmm. relating to other people as free equals is, I think, at its essence. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like then the solar punk aesthetic um kind of became like the it's kind of like the imaginary uh utopian creative side of things and the social ecology side of things might be the more practical kind of how to organize part of it so what do you think then might might a kind of solar punk uh, social ecologist world or community look like how might that manifest as a reality Uh, I think some of the most obvious signifiers would be things like moving the production of things as close as possible to the point of consumption through the use of decentralized forms of technology, like, for example, uh, 3D printing, vertical farming, micromanufacturing, free and open source software, all, of course, uh, generated through renewable energy. That would be the most obvious physical difference between what we have now versus what would be desired. Mm. And in terms of social differences, most obvious would be, as a very general thing, the elimination of hierarchies between people, between genders, between races, between people with disabilities versus able-bodied people. Of course, the elimination of poverty, the elimination of economic inequality, and the reorganization of the way we make and distribute things through egalitarian cooperation rather than hierarchy and centralization. That means workplaces run and operated by those who work there in a horizontal fashion through, for example, assembly meetings, through uh, ad hoc forms of organization, through rather than making everything into a pyramid and organizing it from the top down, mm-hmm. breaking an organ- a large organization up into smaller self-governing units and having them relate to each other in a uh, egalitarian manner and replacing pyramidic forms of organization with network-like forms of organization so that things that are made in such a way that those who are most affected by decisions are the ones who have the primary role in making those decisions, Mm -hmm. I think. And uh, the same in politics, that uh, communities would be governed primarily by those who live there. Law would become more of a voluntary collection of free agreements between residents of a given location rather than something that's externally imposed from without by some far-off power. Mm. In general, a kind of lateralization of decision-making capacity Mm. yeah so there's that thing about kind of empowering people and localizing power so that 
you know, um, people are able to have an effect on their part of the world, really, um, mm -hmm. and like and have the resources managed kind of democratically. Then, mm -hmm. lots of anarchists, I should point out, however, don't like the word. Uh, they agree with the sentiment, but they don't like the word democracy. They tend to associate mm -hmm. democracy with the idea that the majority has some kind of a right to reign over the minority, which is not something anarchists are cool with at all. Mm. Uh, if you define democracy, however, in the broad sense as just those who are affected by decisions should make those decisions, then yes, not only is it democratic, it's maybe the most democratic of any other theoretical system. Although if you mm. define democracy as the majority r ruling over the minority, then it isn't. It's something altogether different. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of debate within anarchism about this, although to a large extent, I think it's more semantic than actual. But yes, in, in general, the principle is that power decision-making ability should be distributed as far and wide as is possible so that we reach a situation where it's very difficult, if not impossible, for one person to wield power over another. Yeah. So that it's, as I said, horizontalized to the greatest extent possible. I do think that it's not reasonable to hope to eliminate each and every form of authority or instance of coercion ever. I, I do think there will always be cases where there are problems to be sorted out. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think that, uh, or even there will be exceptions to the rule, like in cases of, say, a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a tsunami or something like that, it may be necessary to temporarily concentrate power in, say, a council of experts in order to get people to safety or organize things in such a way that the most amount of people can survive. But uh, I think in most situations, it's better to have things horizontalized rather than concentrated as far as decision-making mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. But there are exceptions, of course, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm not so utopian that uh, I think it can all be eliminated all the time in all situations. Yeah. Okay. So Solarpunk, from what I've seen anyway, in, in terms of the imagery, is very futuristic looking. So things like some of the things you've mentioned, like 3D printing and green technology and so on. But it's also looking to maybe restore or rebalance um, the human connection to nature. Mm -hmm. So how is that different, though, from the kind of the primitivist aspects of anarchism that also want to return to nature, but do away with technology in a lot of cases? Well, first of all, I... Again, this is disputed. I personally wouldn't really consider primitivism to be anarchist at all. M most primitivists tend to associate themselves with anarchism, but I, I don't think it has much of a connection at the theoretical level with most of what was classically called anarchism, most of which were, if you look at the founding texts of anarchist thought, uh, were generally quite... Uh, pro new forms of technology. Uh, if you read, for example, the works of Peter Kropotkin writing in the late 19th and early 20th century, he was enthusiastic about things like greenhouses, washing machines, uh, anything that would uh, reduce the amount of drudgery and rote work that people have to do and increase their amount of leisure time. Where it would differ, though, is that primitivists and social anarchists both agree that the current trajectory the world is on is not good. Where we sharply disagree is on the solution to ecological and social problems. Primitivists want to basically watch the existing civilization collapse and for the remaining humans that are left after the cataclysm to return to a kind of hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Uh, some even go as far as saying we should de-evolve, we should give up uh, language, counting, uh, pretty much everything, and basically return to the state we were in about 100,000 years ago, before agriculture, before uh, civilization, everything. While some forms of solar punk fiction imagine the world being rebuilt after such a cataclysm, most, I think, in terms of real life, what we should move towards in real life, are more about 
avoiding such a catastrophe, such a collapse of civilization, trying to build bits and pieces of the world we want to see in the here and now by creating, for example, cooperatives, by creating mm. intentional communities, creating the future seeds, the, the seeds mm. of the society we want to live in, so that we will have a structure in place ready to take over, ready to for people to step into and uh, for society to reconstitute itself mm. once existing structures of power either fade away or collapse. Uh, mm. I would hope fade away. I, again, I personally at least would hope that we could avoid anything that would result in a collapse of things as opposed to just a gradual moving away from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I suppose the way things are at the minute, it's kind of, it's hard to say because there's a lot of different kind of climate uh, science. Some is predicting, you know, when it tell, when you look at the research and different scientists have different views as to when the world might become uninhabitable or, you know, insect populations are declining rapidly, but then another report will come out and say they're not as rapid as that previous report and so on. I mean, we're obviously faced with pretty awful stuff up ahead, but it's difficult to know how quickly things will happen and maybe some parts will collapse and others won't. I don't know. Yeah, I think the way primitivists tend to imagine it is they imagine one big global collapse all happening all at once. I think if mm -hmm. such a collapse ever did happen, it wouldn't be like that at all. I think it would be very slow and painful and protracted with the wealthier parts of the world hanging on for much longer than the poorer parts of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I, the, the, if anything, it's almost utopian in the, in the negative sense, primitivism, because mm -hmm. in a sense, they, they imagine this big global collapse of civilization brought on by climate change and social breakdown to be a great leveler. They imagine this will restore humanity to this imagined previous state of equality. I don't think that's actually likely at all. I think what's most likely is the poorest of the world will be first to retreat into uh, despair and breakdown and the richer part, the richest parts of the world will retreat into walled cities, uh, with uh, robotic gun turrets outside trying to keep the barbarians uh, mm -hmm. away from the gates. I, I, that's already happening, I think, in certain parts of the global north. You have entirely privatized neighborhoods. Like after Hurricane Katrina, there was uh, a move to insulate the richer parts of New Orleans from the poorer parts. And uh, mm. th that tends to happen uh, whenever the wealthiest of the world fear social or ecological breakdown, they find ways to ensure themselves and protect themselves against the coming breakdown. And it's so it's not going to if it does ever happen, it's not going to be a great leveler. But uh, mm -hmm. to go back to your earlier question about uh, how soon we can expect a collapse like that, I, I wouldn't have gotten into solar punk if I thought that was inevitable. I mm -hmm. think it's possible, but I hope at least it's not inevitable. I fundamentally, I regard the future as unknowable. I think it's something we create rather than something that happens to us uh, passively. Mm -hmm. I think it's something we actively engineer ourselves, both wittingly and unwittingly. So mm -hmm. I do think, at the very least, it's not too late to ensure the best possible outcome, even if it's not as good as we imagine it to be, at the very least, if we if we don't try, we're ensuring that it's something closer to a dystopia rather than a utopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose that's like the kind of, like the core of solar punk is that that hope is actually kind of like a, a rational hope. It's not completely just based on emotion or anything like that. It's um, saying that, you know, if we start building the alternatives now, yeah, aim for the best case scenario and we might get some way along the way, but it's better than the other option, which is to, you know, like be, the, be the one, yeah, give in and be the one re retreating into the walled community. There can be, in fact, a kind of comfort in a masochistic comfort in retreating into despair, because if you if you never try, you can't fail. 
Whereas if you do try, you might fail, but you still stand a better chance of achieving something than if you just wallow in, oh, the world is going to blow up, uh, we're all going to die, uh, woe is us. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that uh, can pass itself off as intellectual or even at worst realistic uh, from a certain point of view and to a certain sort of person. To me, it really is the antithesis of realism. Many of these people who imagine the worst possible case scenario, they call themselves climate realists. And I think th there's nothing realistic about that. Like you can imagine the most uh, devastating scenario imaginable, but really I think it's more science fictional than Star Trek, to be honest, because... Uh, mm -hmm. If you look back through history at all the possible worst case scenarios, they very rarely come to be. I mean, the most pessimistic of the pessimists during the Cold War were counting down the minutes until there was going to be nuclear Armageddon and the destruction of all life on Earth. And that never happened. We managed to think our way out of it. And uh, mm -hmm. I do think the same is possible now that we're faced, now that nuclear war is still a possibility but it's no longer the possibility that it once was and i think in time the same will become true of the climate crisis if and only if we find a way to creatively think our way out of it think and socially organize our way out of it that is mm. okay and on your blog you've written about solar punk virtues Oh yeah, that was. Uh, I should I should explain that particular uh, blog post was. Uh, it was very much just me thinking out loud. If if I could, uh -huh. I wasn't on Twitter at the time. But if I was, I probably would have uh, just made that a a tweet thread rather than an actual mm -hmm. blog post. I still stand by uh, most of what's there, but I do think in retrospect it's quite disorganized. But yeah, I said that virtue, reason, and compassion. Those two, three, those three things. Uh, taken together form a good set of uh, principles for uh, relating to the world in a solar punk-ish kind of way. Okay. So one of the virtues is to do with self-fulfillment for all living beings. And I just wondered what your thoughts might be in terms of what that might mean for non-human animals. Yeah, I think it is senseless when, if trying to build a better world to build a better world for human beings only. I think it should also extend to all forms of life on the planet. I cannot understand why you could want a world that reconciles humanity with nature and still treat non-humans, both uh, sentient and non-sentient uh, non-humans, as some kind of a resource to exploit it, whether that's non-human mm. animals or natural ecology so yeah i mm -hmm. i'm kind of a cautious animal liberationist i uh it's not something i've focused a lot on in the few bits i've written thus far although i think it will be when i eventually return to writing on the blog it's it's been dormant mm -hmm. for a while as as of the time of the recording of this podcast, although I do hope to get back into it uh, quite soon. I'm already working on a piece that should be published in the next week. Okay, great. And when I eventually get back to it, I will certainly consider writing some more pieces uh, in and around animal liberation as a topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I look forward to that. Another thing you've written about is about freedom and justice in liberatory movements. And it's the thing about the difference between the, the quest for justice or the quest for freedom in terms of however that fits into like liberation. Did you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, I think if you look back at the, at least in the last, say, two centuries, uh, if you look at the history of movements that have fought for freedom or rather liberation, more broadly speaking, they tend to take the form of arguing for it on the basis of either freedom or justice. And in many ways, they're kind of like two ways of looking at the same thing, although there isn't really a word I can think of that covers both at the same time. If you look at uh, social problems from the perspective of freedom, like take inequality, for example, if you look at it from the perspective of freedom, freedom, 
inequality is bad because those at the bottom are not free, only the, those at the top are free. If you look at the problem of inequality from the perspective of justice, it's wrong because it's unfair for some people to have more and others to have less when those who have more may not necessarily be doing anything to earn it, and those who are at the bottom and have less may be doing far more, theoretically, to earn it. So at different times, however, I notice that whichever movement tends to win, either politically or culturally, that tends to become used almost as a stick to beat people with uh, going forward. Like in the 1960s, for example, in the counterculture, it was all about freedom. And mm. because of what's widely called neoliberalism, freedom, liberty, uh, sovereignty of the individual, these with Thatcher and Reagan, these became the uh, reigning truths of the day. Uh, mm. It's the economic system we live under has been framed as free, as liberated, as uh, all about individuality, whereas previously in the post-war compromise with when you had Keynesian economics, social democratic policies, the welfare state, it was more about justice. I think because everything in the last few decades has been the reigning status quo has been framed as something free, something that's all about liberty. I think movements tend to focus more on justice as an antidote to that. Mm -hmm. It's it's all about social justice now. Uh, leftists generally, they talk more about social justice than they do about freedom. And I think that that definitely has its place. Although I think nowadays, we've maybe had a bit too much of framing things in terms of justice to such an extent that people, a lot, a lot of people, I, I, I won't name names, but uh, a lot mm -hmm. of movements tend to advocate for justice in such a way that I think it reduces freedom rather than enhances it. So I think it would be more beneficial for us to argue against this system which prizes liberty above all else in terms of it's not really it doesn't really guarantee liberty at all. We should, in mm -hmm. fact, frame our movements in terms of gaining a more authentic form of liberty rather than using justice as an antidote to liberty, because mm -hmm. I think that's meeting, it's beating it at its own game, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I think, like, when you were talking about Reagan and Thatcher there, it sounds like what happened is that the state managed to or, or the neoliberal like discourse managed to um like co-opt those ideas that were coming out exactly. of the 60s of like personal freedom and so on and say well actually we're giving mm. you what you wanted um here you can buy all the stuff <laughs> mm. it was reframing uh social freedom as consumer freedom mm -hmm. and that's kind of one of the biggest problems that we have in I would say the animal rights movement, but I don't really think it is the animal rights movement because I'm not sure. It, I think the movement itself doesn't know what it is at the minute, but that we have bought into the concept that by changing consumers' minds, um, if they just buy plant-based burgers and we get everyone, enough people to buy them, that will change the demand. And then, mm. you know, the meat uh, companies will start changing what they sell us. And it's just that neoliberal um, individualist um, myth that, that people have bought mm -hmm. into. And uh, going back a, a few steps towards the freedom versus justice framing, you're already starting to see the system trying to co-op justice as a way of selling you things, like uh, mm -hmm. the attitude of uh, like getting more women involved in politics in the worst workplace, getting more people of color involved, getting LGBT people involved. It's, uh, it's commonly called the faces in high places approach. It's mm -hmm. another way to sell people things, not really giving people justice, but giving people the illusion of justice. It's co-opting many of the demands of social justice movements who are fighting for justice in a more meaningful sense. And instrumentalizing it as a way to sell people things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, another thing you wrote about on the blog was about infrapolitics and megapolitics. And I think we've maybe kind of covered some of this in terms of like the building the alternative now. But I think what I took from it was more that it was about the difference between like actively being political and then some people might rather focus on doing things culturally, trying to bring about change through cultural means such as music or art. So how do those two interact? The difference is normally framed in terms of what's often called capital P politics versus small p politics, where they both have an effect on the way people live their lives and the way we organize society. But uh, one has a more direct and overt effect, whereas the other has a more slower and more nuanced effect. Uh, legislation, for example, has a very noticeable and immediate effect in the here and now, whereas uh, what happens in, say, music or art or subcultures has more of a underground effect, uh, but may in fact change society in a big way in the long term. They borrow from each other quite a bit, I think. I don't think there's this ironclad distinction between them, although I think a lot of people who are in favor of capital P politics, or megapolitics as I called it, often like to dismiss small p politics or infrapolitics as an irrelevant distraction. It's kind of like, why are you people over there doing all this crazy art that's not helping anybody like mm. join a trade union like support a political mm. party that'll really change things i mm. i don't think it's one or the other i think we need both to have a successful shot at uh, transforming everything and i think we shouldn't maintain that uh one is taking energy away from the other when we can have both when we can have people making politically significant uh art or music or fiction and whatnot while also changing things in a more practical economic and political sense yeah yeah totally because um you know a lot of people aren't going to necessarily necessarily connect or get involved with like the political aspects of things but they might be reading you know reading a book or listening to their favorite band or something like that and so people are always going to engage with art and music and literature. Yeah, and many of those same ideas that they might explore in a fictional context through art or literature or fiction uh, may end up, even if just through osmosis, uh, filtering into their real-world values. I think mm -hmm. in many ways art can change a person's mind more than political propaganda can because... Every piece of art is, I forget who said it, but uh, it's a very good way of describing it. It's like an empathy generator. It's a way of you, it's a way to make a person look at the world in a different way and see things in a way they maybe necessarily, they maybe didn't mm. necessarily see before. It's a way of exposing people to new ideas uh, in a safe environment. And uh, in many cases, uh, people might read a work of fiction or experience a work of art and uh, respond to it on a gut level, on a subconscious level. But uh, the more they look at the world, they mo the more they might realize that those same principles explored in that work of art that I loved, they also are in many ways applicable to the real world. Maybe not in a one-to-one -one sense, but in a more general sense. Uh, yeah. In a more general sense. And uh, I think that many capital P political leftist uh, figures and movements underestimate the value of that and the significance of that. Mm -hmm. We've covered some of this as well, but I was going to ask you, why do you think solar punk is important and how can it form our social just, how can it inform our social justice movements? I don't know if you had any more to say on that. We have kind of covered that in some previous questions i think that solar punk is important uh for social justice because it exposes people to a very radically different way of conceiving how the world could ultimately be if if we 
reorganize things in the right way. It might be something that people might love to visit, like you might visit a holiday destination through art and fiction, but over time, I think through continued exposure to that way of looking at the world and that way of thinking, it could filter into people's real world values and the way they relate to the world they actually live in and what they themselves might be doing to change it. They mm -hmm. might over time realize that the status quo that we live under, ecocide, hierarchy, uh, competition, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way. If it's conceivable through art, it's more easy to conceive of it in reality. At least that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future looks like for solar punk with it being still a fairly niche genre and movement? Um, how does it become more political or more mainstream? I think as a genre, as a science fiction genre and subculture, how it becomes more mainstream is, I think, quite simple. Uh, somebody or somebody plural just needs to create something, whether it be a novel, video game, graphic novel, movie, TV series, whatever it may be, that is explicitly solar punk, as in within that genre, and it becomes popular and people like it. I think all it takes is one example of the genre to become popular and you'll see what was previously a very niche subculture become quite a lot, maybe still a cult subculture, but certainly a lot less niche uh, as a result of more people getting into it. I think that's how it uh, goes a bit more mainstream. Uh, how it becomes more political? I think it already is pretty political, maybe not in an overt sense, but certainly if you look at chat groups, if you look at discourse in and around it, uh, even if people are talking about aspects of solar punk in the context of fiction, they're still talking about very radical things about, for example, imagining what a society might operate like if we eliminated the use of money, if we reached eventual condition of uh, post-scarcity, how we could organize an entire city to be self-sufficient uh, through a mix of vertical farming, cultured meat, uh, things like that. Uh, these are, I think, innately political things, even if the people discussing them in the context of fiction don't immediately recognize them as such. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, people going to punk shows in the late 70s and early 80s may not have initially seen anything that political about the lyrics, but if you listen to the lyrics talking about individual autonomy and uh, down with the class system, uh, things like that, these were quite political things. And over time can filter into people's consciousness. Yeah, I could just before we leave uh, recommend a YouTube video uh, people can look up if they want to learn more. It's called uh, Imagining a Solar Punk Future, but uh, it's a TED Talk by uh, Keisha Howard. Uh, she once uh, got into contact with me on Facebook uh, asking me a few questions, and that uh, made its way into her TED Talk. And it's a really good uh, kind of 101, 10 minute long intro to the genre. And uh, so if anyone wants to learn a little bit more after listening to the episode, that's a great place to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.